This evening, um, we're continuing with the focus on our theme, which is? It's right there. What's the theme? Our only hope. So you saw it. Our only hope. I want to entitle this little discourse, discourse this evening, The Praise of the Glory of His Grace. And you know that's a direct quote from the scriptures. The Praise of the Glory of His Grace. Marvelous Grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, infinite grace. Grace that is greater than all our sins. That's one songwriter's way of putting it. Interesting, because um, I suppose there are many songs that have been written about grace, and, and they all have good intentions. The authors, writers, um, understanding of grace. Grace in my own mind, is a perfect description of God's love as it is revealed. There is indeed no other word for grace but amazing. As I've looked at the adjectives, marvelous, infinite, matchless, amazing, wonderful, are all but our attempt to express what we feel, what we see or understand about this grace. Welcome, welcome. Good to see you, Troy. This evening, we're going to be looking at the book of Ephesians. Let me get this rolling. So when John comes, it will be all up and ready. Yeah. The book of Ephesians, in my own opinion, is the book of grace. I don't, there is no other book in the Bible that, dis, that discusses and talks about grace the way he, Paul does in writing to those Christians in Ephesus. Well, you might agree as well as not, but let's just dig into it somewhat and see what this book has to say about grace. What do you know about grace? What is grace? For most of us, if not all of us, the common definition of grace is unmerited favor. All my life, this is what I've heard. There seemed to be no other understanding of grace excepting unmerited favor. Now, what if I should ask you, if I should ask you to give me your understanding of grace, or give me a definition of grace without using that term, unmerited favor. Could you? A free gift. All right, reasonable. Free gift. The steps but, of salvation. Hmm? The steps of salvation. The steps of salvation. Or what about salvation? Uh -huh. Isn't salvation grace? We looked at that verse yesterday, Ephesians 2 8, that says, For by Grace by, by grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. But let me ask you, what is the reality of grace? What is the tangible evidence of God's favor? Who is the personification of grace? Jesus. Then you're getting closer to understanding 
what Paul understood when he spoke about grace. Now, so I want us to look at grace, and, and I won't say in its entirety, but at, at least let's see if we can examine here how he describes what he understands this to be from the book of Ephesians. Let's go now to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Let's, let's just begin in verse 1. As I said, this is, more like, this is more like a Bible study, so we can all be kept awake um, as we explore the Word together. Ephesians chapter 1. Paul, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and he's writing to whom now? The saints. Now, please make a note of that. And for those who thought yesterday I was... What was he saying? I said, if you are not a sinner, who are you? A saint. Now here Paul was writing to some people. Were they people like you and me? Of course. But these people had received something and now Paul was writing to who? The saints in Ephesus. And to the faithful in Christ Jesus. And I suppose he's writing to us too. Let me just pause here to say, those who are just coming in, just remember, don't cross the aisle because the camera is running directly at me. Walk to the back. Um, and I'm sure the camera lady would be happy. So he's writing to who, beloved? The saints. The saints of God. Now, is that inclusive of you? Oh, I want to tell you, I am right there, Dennis. He's talking to me. He's talking to a saint. One who has received new life. And has been transformed into a son. Alright, he says, Grace, verse 2, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Very, very, very common in the way he always salutes the brethren he writes. And you can tell from the beginning, you can tell Paul was not a Trinitarian, right? <laughs> it's clear. He makes it known in every letter he writes. He tells you. He's writing from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So you know he had an understanding that not many people had, right? So, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's see how he gets into this. Who had blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Where? In heavenly places in Christ. All I'm asking that I do and all of us do as we open the Word is just look and see what we've been given. I didn't know my lawnmower had those attachments. I didn't know my lawnmower could do all the things it, 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 it was able to do until somebody taught me and said, Hey, you can do this too. Here's what he's telling you. He's telling you who you are. He's telling you what you were made to be. Most of us, we have received the Spirit, but we didn't know much more. Here, Paul is teaching us. He's showing us, hey, don't think you're just human. You're just another person. No, no, no. You are a son. You are a daughter. You are a child of God. And you, are been, you have been blessed with how many blessings, beloved? All. All. Now, let me ask you, think about in your mind one spiritual blessing that you think would be too far above what you have. Can you conceive such? If you can, Paul says, you have been given it. Where? Where? In Christ. Let's go on. Verse 4. According as He has chosen us where? Don't miss that. Let's look at the predestination. Because did you know I believe in predestination? Did I tell you that before? I believe in predestination. It's right here in verse 4. Look at what he says. According as he has chosen us where? In him. How long ago? Before the foundation of the world. And that we should be holy. Did you see that? And what? Without blame. Where? Before Him in love. Isn't it beautiful when you just stop and take the scriptures? Just let's look at the one verse at a time, one, word, one phrase at a time. It just becomes so beautiful. Verse 5 says, 
having, he has made us holy without blame in, in, in love, having predestinated us. That's the word. He has predestinated me and you and all of this world and every human being alive today who were born in Adam were predestined to what? Unto adoption, the adoption of children where? By Jesus Christ himself, according to what? The good pleasure of His will. So this is where we have been given. We have been given life everlasting. Before the foundation of the world, He predestined that every human being born in Adam's race, who would have come to find out that they are lost and condemned and doomed forever, there was a place already made in Christ for that person. That if you would only accept Christ, he was predestined to be a son. Only accept Christ and all spiritual blessings were there in him. Look at verse 6, which brings you my topic. That's where it came from. He did all of this according to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise. Look at what he says next. Of the glory of what beloved grace. is grace wherein he had made us accepted in the beloved so we're going to be examining this grace and really see God your grace is wonderful and when we come to see what his grace has done for us I hope by all that he has given us we would believe it because if we believe it, we might just accept it. I think that's where the challenge is. The challenge is believing it. It's not accepting it, that's the challenge. It's believing it first. When you believe it, there's no problem. You'll accept it. All right. I see, I've already seen a few people, uh, you know, struggling to stay awake. And it's okay if you stand and walk to the, to the back. I'll understand. And the others will too. Verse 7. In whom, he's talking now about the beloved, being accepted in the beloved. In whom we have what, beloved? Redemption through his blood. And you know that's referring to his life. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of what? His grace. Oh, this is just a repeat of what we've looked at so far. Doesn't seem that way. So, here's what he's telling you. We didn't read this passage, did we? There's another passage that's saying the same thing that we've been saying since we started. That that is what he has done for us. That is what he has done for humanity. That is why for you to consider this reality and believe it and begin to talk it would help you to experiencing it. Who are you? Oh, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Is that what the word says? No. Hmm? It says you have been redeemed. It says, you just read it. It says you have been redeemed through his blood. You have been forgiven of your sins. According to what? The riches of his grace. His grace. His grace. His love. His grace. Can you separate them? has been bestowed upon us in abundance, wherein he has abounded towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us, verse 9 says, having made known unto us what? The mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he had purposed in himself. Now, obviously, he's bringing us an, an, an idea here in showing us why he did what he did in Jesus. And what's the reason? The good pleasure of his will. Is that correct? Why did he do the things he do? Why did he save us? Were we, were we deserving of salvation? No! It was because he loved us. I mean, it's hard for me to express that kind of love because honestly, I don't know it. I'm, I'm just getting an understanding of it. And so, 
until it has permeated me enough, you're going to see it lived out in me. You're going to see my heart will ache for the world, for the lost, for those who are suffering, for those who don't know Him. Then you can begin to understand, I'll begin to understand and feel what He feels when my heart yearns for others like that. I mean, I read where Jesus said, He looked at the people, and the Word says, when He looked at them, they were like sheep without shepherd. And He said, He looked at the disciples and He said, The harvest truly is plenty. But He says, The laborers are few. He says, Pray the Lord of the harvest, that He will send forth laborers in His harvest. So, there was something He was feeling. Honestly, you feel like that? I'm getting glimmers, you know? I'll go down to the to the marketplace with my wife sometimes, and I'll, and I'll, I'll, most times I like to stay in the car. <laughs> and you know we don't have these parking lots like you have here. We park and walk away. You know we do have some, but but I can actually park right in in the midst of the crowd, going back and forth. And sometimes I'll just stop. I'll just I'll just look and I'll just see people. You see faces. They're just moving from place to place. They're just going, and. Something just moves because I ask God, how are we going to reach these people? Oh, okay, I could come out of my car. I could stand on the side and say, hey, people, people, I have a word for you. And I start preaching. And guess what? A few may stop and listen. And then, you know what's the strange part? A few may come and, and throw a dollar or so at my foot. It's the norm. It's, it's a way of making money in some places. And that's not my intention. I don't need a dollar. I need you to stop for a moment and think. Do you know where you're going? Do you know what lies ahead? In, I mean, do you know what's before you? But, interesting. We don't feel it very often. We don't feel it very often. We rarely. You know, I was yesterday. Yesterday, somebody came in while we, were, while we were having the meeting. Not many people saw him or noticed him. He came, he went to the bathroom, he came, he sat down. He was a little uneasy. And I'm thinking, God, what do I say to this person? He's probably, what I'm saying was probably over his head. But he want, I'm sure he wanted a word. Does that happen to you sometimes? You just look. I'm thinking, this is what happens to Jesus. And this is what will happen to you and me when we are fully possessed by Him. Because that will be our mission in this world. Mm -hmm. And so, I'm saying all of that to come back to the reason. He says He gave us all of this. It is according to the good pleasure of His will. Let's go on. Verse 9. Let's pick up in verse 9 again. Having made known unto us the mystery of His will. And we just heard what His will was, that we all would receive this reality in Jesus. But it gets, it gets sweeter. According to, his, to the good pleasure, to His good pleasure which He had purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, He might gather together all in one, all things where? In Christ, both things which are in heaven and things which are on earth, even in Him. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated, that's the word again, according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His will. He's simply saying, Jesus is now working according to God's, the purpose of God's will, in what He's giving to humanity. Next verse. That we should be to the praise of His glory, who first trusted in Christ. In whom you also trusted after that you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom after, also after that you believed, you were sealed with what, beloved? The Holy Spirit of promise. And that's a question that I'm going to ask you after I read the next verse. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased position unto the praise of His glory. Have you recognized how much He's talking about this grace and the praise of this glory of His grace? Are you seeing it? Question. 
Did you receive that Holy Spirit of promise? This is the key question, and this is a personal one. Since you believed, have you received that Holy Spirit of promise? Now, notice what he says. He says that this Holy Spirit of promise, verse 14, is the earnest. That's an old English word, the earnest of our inheritance. But it simply means it's your deposit. It's your down payment until he has redeemed you completely. In, in other words, until you're taken away. So here is what he says, based on the, 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 his good purpose, the good purpose of his will towards us, he has given us grace. So much grace that all spiritual blessings have been given to us. Where? In Christ. Now he says, when Christ comes, he brings, he himself is, because we just said the Lord is that spirit, isn't that right? 2 Corinthians 3.17, he says, that spirit is what seals us. This is God's down payment upon us. This is God's seal upon us to say, He belongs to me. Don't call my son or my daughter a sinner. That's a saint. My spirit seals him. My spirit settles this reality that he belongs to me. And that is the down payment that we have, been, we have received. That is the, the, dis, the, the, the um, no, not discount. It's the deposit that we have received. He says, Your, my spirit in you testifies to this fact that you belong to me. Do you know that he lives within you? Do you know that? Do you have that reality? Do you have that manifestation in you that makes you know? It's beautiful when you know. It's beautiful when you know. It's beautiful when, when there is no question in your mind. You just know that He lives there. And He lets you know. And it's not for you. It's for me and Him. The reality is what you will see. So He says He gives us this until He's ready to redeem us. Uh, rede redeem us, take us away. Where the, the, and the complete, in fact, there's a verse in Ephesians where, oh, the same book too. Um, chapter 4 and verse 30. You remember what that verse says? And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. What does it say next? Do you remember? Whereby, Whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Isn't this say, saying the same thing? He's saying the same thing. All right. Now, verse 15. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in, in the Lord Jesus, and the love unto all saints, and that's what we're looking for, the love unto all saints, and hopefully I'll be able to touch on that a little bit, on that reality of love, love inside, when He comes. I mean, this is the greatest need of, of everybody in this room, love, true love. And... The truth is that, that, that reality, we yearn and long and desire for love, for true love. We, and we do many things trying to get it. But you know, there's no love that can satisfy like God's love. When you receive that love, and that's not theory. That's not theory. When you receive that love, that love fulfills you fulfills you. I heard a testimony just recently, and I'm um, hoping this won't take much time. They, 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 this was um, over there in Europe. We were there uh, this last year, was it? Yes. And anyway, we met this lady that she, um, she had spent an, an entire lifetime in um, dancing, in clubs and all of that, and, and all that goes with that. And she 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 was just she was just a total wreck as she puts it and she said um she went one day she said she was on and drugs i mean life was nothing it was just from one high to the next you know and she was on she was overdosed on something and acid whatever it was and she said she was in a room and she Something said to her, look in the mirror. And she said, when she got up and looked in the mirror, she was even frightened. She said, what she saw, she saw the devil 
Well, that's her expression. And she said, I mean, she couldn't, she couldn't stand the sight. And she said, she went down, she said, God, if you're real, as they say, help me. And she came up. And she looked and she said, immediately she could see some changes. What she saw and what she now sees. Anyway, she, ha she knew nothing about God and, and, you know, lived in a, a world where nothing was said about God. But somehow, somewhere, she remembered the idea of God. And something happened to her, but it, it didn't last. Because pretty soon she went back to her trade. She, she knew nothing more, she said. And she went back to drugs and all of this. And then she said one day, she almost died. And she cried out to him. And as she cried out, she said, she said, if you're real, God, reveal yourself to me. Show me. Let me know now. And she had an experience. She said, for two hours, God just came into her body and just flooded her body and her life would happen. She cried for two hours. It was all tears of joy. Now, you rarely hear this kind of experience. And she said, she felt so different, but she didn't know what to do. She went back to the club to dance. And she said what was interesting, she said she remember in the club she was dancing and she was on the pole and she was dancing. And she said she looked at the men and they were all fixed. And she said as she looked at their eyes, they were all looking at her from here down. She said not one of them looked at her face. She said, had they done that, they would have seen tears. But the Spirit said to her, this is not where you're supposed to be. And she left, didn't know where she was going. It was a beautiful experience when she talked about it. She was there at the, at the camp meeting and she was just showing us how she knows God is real. This, is what a, this wasn't the sermon she heard. She met him personally. Where? In my room. Where? On the floor. He came and he did something to my life. And she was looking back and she says, I didn't understand love. I was frustrated. I was an illeg illegitimate child. I never knew my dad. And she just searched for love. Now she says she's fulfilled in him because she has an experience. Oh, if I could have such an experience. Oh, if you would have such an experience, right? But it's real. God is that real. And when you reach a place like she reached, when you want an experience like she got, you will get it. You know why? Because your heart will be after it. All right, here we go, verse 18. He's praying now, and he's saying that um, in his prayer, Wherefore, verse 15, I, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and the love towards all saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, and that the Lord of our, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, that the eyes of your understanding, look at this prayer now, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ Jesus, when he raised him from the dead and set him on his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world that is to come, and had put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him that filleth what all in all question are you a member of his body this is an interesting concept whose body whose body Jesus's body now I want you to think for a moment and you may not have thought of things in this way 
one man will be saved. Are you aware of this? There's only one man that will be saved. And that is Jesus. Only one man already has salvation, possess salvation. And you know who that one man is? That's Jesus. You possess salvation because you are in that one man. In fact, in, in the Bible's terminology of things, there was only one man that was lost. That was Adam. If you are lost, it's because you are in that one man. How does this work? Because God made one life, and that one life was passed on to all men. All of us in this room share, possess a part of this one life. God never made two lives. One life, that life has been procreated from generation to generation for 6,000 years to the young baby. In that life is separation from God. That John, in that life, Adam's life is separation from God. Now God made another life, a new life. This life is in union with God. This life has in it conquering power over sin. This life has in it the glorification of the, the, the Father Himself. And this life possesses salvation, redemption, forgiveness of sins. I mean, you name it. All spiritual blessings is there. So, which life do you possess? Adam's life or Christ's life? If you have Adam's life, then where are you? In Adam. If you have Christ's life, then where are you? How do you get into Christ? By faith. But it's Christ that, co that comes in you and makes His home in you. And now you are part of His body. I, I mention this because this is what it says here. That we have been placed in Christ. And where is Christ? Christ said, um, Paul just said, that He has been set on the right hand of God. Where? In heavenly places. Then He says that He was set far above all principality, all power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but that which is to come. Is that where you are? Amen. That's what the Word says. Wait till we get to the next chapter, then you'll see where we actually live. See, you have to see it and understand it before you experience it. You have to buy it and read about it before you begin to experiment with it. And right? That is where we have been placed, in Christ, who is the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. Alright, let's go now to chapter 2 and compare a couple of things here. Let's start in verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversations in time past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Who is this talking about? You and me. Is this where we were? That's what he says. This is where we were. This is who we were. In times past, this was your condition. And he says the condition that you had then was just like others who are outside of Christ. It's just like they have now. But God, verse 4, who is rich in mercy, for His great love where He had loved us, even when we were dead in sins, did what? Hath quickened us together with Christ. That's amazing. Even when we were dead in sins, God did something. What did He do? What does it mean to quicken? To give life. To make alive. He says, even when you were dead in sins and trespasses. Is that true about the world out there? 
that have been dead in sins and trespasses, that God has actually made them alive? But where? I want you to think about it. This is not something that you, you hear very often. That the world, John, the world has been saved. Already saved. Where? In Christ. In Christ. Now, why is it that they don't experience salvation? Huh? They don't know. They were never told. And so because of that, they never enter the experience in Christ. And so they never experience this. They never get a hold of the reality. Now, I can understand what Paul means now when he talks about the ministry of reconciliation. Go let people know, God is reconciled to you. He has no problem with you. Why don't you be reconciled to Him? That's the message we have. That's the ministry we have. And it's all because, one, the, the good purpose of His will, and what? The praise of the glory of His grace. That's why he did it. Let's go on. Look at what he says next. And had, <clears throat> verse 6, and had done what, beloved? Oh yeah, I need to get you reading. Yeah, read that one for me. Everybody now. The sleepers even. Verse 6. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Hold a minute. Look at what the word just says. He has not only saved us, He has not only quickened us, but what has He done also? He has raised us up together and made us sit. Where? Now, let me ask you, where are you today? Where are you today? I mean, when you understand this, you'll recognize that why, why should you allow others to determine who you are? When God already told you what you are, who you are, where you are. Why? Why do you listen to others? Like that boy waiting for his father. Why don't you just tell them? I know the ship will come. My father is the captain. I mean, this is who you are. I, I am, I am, I was thinking the other day, what if the things I'm now teaching my children, Dennis, I was thinking, what if I, what if I heard these when I was young like they are? What, what would have been my condition? That's what I'm thinking about. And sometimes I get alarmed at this and say, man, when will we take a hold of this? And then the Lord says, I guess you'll have to take a hold of it first. And when they see you and your experience, then others will want it. It's interesting. I was looking back how, how that all these big movements, the Reformation and all of this, all began with one man. Isn't that right? All these big movements, one man, and he stuck with what he knew and something happened. Others begin, began seeing and joining and the movement got bigger. I suppose when God asked Isaiah, now who will go, whom shall we send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here my Lord, send me. That's the question today. Who is willing to be that witness? And, test, and testify of this goodness of God. Who? I hope I can say me. It's just interesting. It's interesting when, 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 you're, when you have lived in an environment that have kept you down and made you know you were no better than those around you and that they were, you were even less than those above you. You grow with that mentality. You never see yourself excelling beyond that. Now we're reading something and we're saying, I don't know. So, am I, not, am I the first person reading this? Why is it I'm not seeing anybody else experiencing this? And this kind of reasoning keeps us down. But we're just reading something and what we're reading is that we are, we are in heavenly places. We are made to sit together 
in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Are you living in heavenly places? Amen. I realize why some, some people were able to, in the dark ages, they, they were killed and, and, um, for the sake of Christ. And it seemed like it was no pain. They went through some terrible deaths and yet it seemed they were singing. How is that possible? Maybe they were getting a glimpse of what we're talking about here. Isn't that right? Alright, so here's what he is telling us now. He's telling us that he has done all of these wonderful things for us in Christ Jesus. He has given us, listen, let's see if we can re recap. He has given us all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. He has redeemed us from our sins. No, He has redeemed us by His life, His blood. He has cleansed us from our sins. He has made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He has done all of this for us. Why? Because of the good pleasure of His will. But what else? I think Paul addresses this next. That in the ages to come, verse 7. That in the ages to come, hmm, when is that? He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For it was all a gift. It was all a gift. By grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. It's not of works, he says, lest any man should boast. It's not your working for this. It is the reality of him coming and taking you over and giving you this reality free. Free. All it needs is your, take, your, your saying, Father, I have listened. And I'll take this that you've given. Because... I need you. I realize, I once read a passage that says, When thy judgments are upon the land, thy people shall learn righteousness. And I recognize most times we don't actually make certain moves until we are backed up against the wall. Did you know that? You've heard that? You never look up until you're flat on your back. When, when things get hard and there seems to be no way out, you know what we say then? God, only you. I have a cousin, a, fa a family member. She has suffered. She had suffered with some extreme problems. She had some difficulties with um, some cancerous growth that was in her womb. Well, this seemed to be a normal thing, and you just do a hysterectomy, and that normally takes care of things. But not so with her case. They could not operate. It was just too dangerous. And she spent money in Jamaican dollars, money, millions. And she said she remembered she went to all the herbalists that were known, home and abroad. She went to the medical field and she did everything. It's interesting. I always mention the story when I talk about God's goodness. She says, she remember, she was sitting in the special, this is not just the doctor, this is the special, the professor. She was sitting in his office she was sitting around his desk and he was turned sideways looking through the window playing with his thumb. And she said there was silence for maybe five minutes. And she said, so doctor, what do you say? He said, I just told you, there is nothing more that medical science can do for you. Nothing more. Read my lips. Nothing more. And he, she, he said, don't even pay the secretary. And she left. 
and she was she was relating this to me she said do you know when we went home I went to church and I called a few people together and I said brethren I'm going to ask you that you spend a few days with me in fasting and prayer and she says let me tell you it's the first time in five years I got relief then I said how much did that cost you this was after she did all she could then she heard the words we can't help you that's it then she says God only you now this is interesting because it didn't cost her anything it probably helped her because she didn't eat for a few days and started getting relief isn't that interesting when will we ever learn the lesson I mean I recognize the Bible is, is, a, is a wonderful history book Remember, the Bible is just a, 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 a compilation of experiences of men and women and people who have, who have followed God, who God have led and who have turned away from Him and come back to Him. And so, you know, that's what the Bible is. And it was written that we will learn by reading these examples, we will learn to trust Him more. But isn't it the truth that we sometimes don't learn? We never get it until we are were put in that experience and placed right there well I'm thinking father if that's what it takes to get me to the place where you want me then bring it on Amen. I'm ready not many people want to get to that place not many people like to suffer not many people like to to be in the place of uncertainty and not knowing what will come tomorrow and what is about to happen next not many people like that kind of situation but you know, if that's what, what it will take to get the best out of me, De and Dennis, then why not bring it on? I'd like to have it. Because it will come sooner or later. Better sooner than later. Alright, let's get back to the, to the glory of His grace here. Alright, so he gets on down in chapter 2 here. And let's skip a couple of places since we're gone with time. Let's get down to verse... Um, 19. Hmm, let's see if I missed something here. Verse 19 says it this way. Now therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but what are you? Fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of who, beloved? The apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together, grow it unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built together for what purpose? For an habitation of God through the Spirit. Question, do you recognize that this is your reality? That you are an habitation of God? That's what Paul meant when he says that your body is the temple. I had a, a, an old man, a friend of mine. He was what we call today illiterate. He couldn't read. He was sick and he went to the hospital and he was there. He was sharing with me a testimony. He said when he was in the hospital bed there was a man that was next to him. And he said the man was a smoker. And he was even smoking in the hospital. And he said, um, he was wondering how, how could he talk to this man? And one day he said, um, sir, I'd like, to, I'd like to ask you a question. He said, do you know what the Bible says about your body? And the man says, no, I don't know. He said, it says your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Do you know what a temple is? He says it's a house. So he says the Holy Ghost actually lives in your body. He says, why do you constantly put smoke on the Holy Ghost? He said, consider, sir, 
If you were locked in a room and they would fill that room with smoke, what would happen to you? And he says, well, I wouldn't be able to breathe. He says, that's what you're doing to the Holy Ghost. Do you know? We laugh at that. That reached the man's heart. He said, nobody ever told me that. He said, I never heard that before. He said, yes, that's what the Bible says. And he could quote the verse but not read it, you know. And he quoted the verse. He says, that's what the Bible says. That the Holy Ghost lives in you. And if you are smoking and putting that smoke in there, you're killing the Holy Ghost. That was his understanding. But here Paul says, we are all built for an habitation of God through His Spirit. Man, Amen. we are all built for this. The body of Christ, you and me, in Him, we are made for God to inhabit us and fill us with Himself. I mean, I want you to consider the theme, our only hope. Our only hope is really recognizing this, expecting this, and looking for the experience. That's our only hope. Amen. It's not just talking about it. It's we're looking for the reality of it. It's wonderful to meet year after year, but something must take a hold of us. And very soon too. That's right. It must happen, and it must happen very soon. Now, here is a summary of what I'd like since I'm just finished with chapter 2. I'll just take another high point or so from chapter... Um, let's just go to chapter 4 quickly. And let me give you a verse here. Um, verse 7. Verse 7 says... Want to read this one for me? What does it say? Unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. What does that mean? Oh, well, that could have two meanings. It could mean the gift that God gave in Jesus, or it could mean the gift of Jesus Himself. Look at the verse again. But unto every one of us is given grace. How? According to the measure of the gift of Christ. What is the measure of the gift of Christ? For God so loved the world. That's the measure of Christ. He loved us so much that He gave. What's the measure of of the gift of Christ. Now, it's for you to, to think, what's the measure of this gift that God has given us? What's the measure of it? Can you put a measurement on it? And he says, yet we have been given grace. Whatever your measurement of that gift is, we have been given grace according to that measure. Based on what he's saying, Jesus Christ is the measure of God's grace to us. In agreement? That's the measure of His grace to us. It's measured by Jesus Christ. It's measured by His life. It's measured by the glorified life of Jesus coming on the day of Pentecost and spreading across the world. What a grace. What a gift. It will even be better understood when we are experiencing it. When we are living in heavenly places. Every day that's where we are in heavenly places. You know, my, I'm, I'm looking at my son. Nothing troubles this guy. He's just carefree. It, it, I mean, it annoys me sometimes. <laughs> I'll say, we'll say, it's time to get a bath. And he's just doing his thing. And he said, did I just talk to you? Oh, 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 yes. I'm going to get a bath. I mean, you sometimes have to talk to him three, four times. Nothing matters in this world. Nothing matters. And how I, live, I wish I could be like that. And I'm looking at the Word of God and that's what it says, I am. 
I am his son. I'm looking at the words of Jesus. He says, listen, the birds, they don't toil, they do nothing, and God provides for them. Then he says, aren't you of much more value than many of those birds? I mean, that, 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 um, that um, Sermon on the Mount is really something when you begin to look at it. And especially that one part in it that always hits my heart. He says, For after these things does the Gentiles seek. Have you ever looked at that before? He says, Why are you worrying about your food and so on? Why are you worrying? He says, Gentiles do that. Children don't do that. And it's a fact. My kids never worry. Never. They just say, What am I to wear? What am I going to eat? I'm hungry. It's time to eat. And you know it's the truth. You have kids too. What if we were like that with God? What would that do to his blessed heart? And isn't he wanting to have children like this? That is able to defend his name. Uh, this is the truth. I'm not patriotic. Um, David will tell you. He's far more patriotic than I am. Uh, I do know the fastest man in the world is a Jamaican. That is nothing to me. It's just statistics. Right? But when he's running, Brother David wants to know because he wants to cheer him on. There goes a Jamaican. I don't have that, that, that empathy in my heart. Honestly. Right? I'm seeing more when it comes to the kingdom. When it comes to the kingdom, when it comes to people's salvation, that touches my heart more. More than my country. Amen. And its accomplishments. I travel a bit extensively sometimes and Everywhere you go and somebody sees my passport, Jamaican, hey, Bob Marley. And, uh, yeah, Bob Marley, yes, a Jamaican. You know, it's, it's, it does no, it's nothing, nothing to me. But I'm looking at this reality. And this reality, I, I was reading one in, uh, in Colossians, you know what Paul says, um, don't you know that your citizenship is in heaven. You read that one before? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't say that in the King James Version, but that's really what it means. He says, uh, I think it's Colossians 3 somewhere, where it says that your citizenship is in heaven. And that one touches me. Because if that is the truth, then I want to be a patriot for heaven. I want to stand by the principles of heaven and lift up the kingdom of heaven and let others know, come, be joined to Christ. He's reconciled to you. He wants you to be a part of His kingdom. It's the only kingdom that will last. Only one. Everything else will disappear into nothingness. But there's one kingdom that will stand forever. And will never be destroyed. Amen. And that is His kingdom. His coming kingdom. I'm looking forward to it. I'm hoping you are looking forward to it too. Well, that's about what we had planned. Uh, maybe some other time. We can look at the rest of the Ephesians. But you can do this on your own too. Mm -hmm. And I hope as you look at it wor word by word, verse by verse, phrase by phrase, that the blessing will just multiply. Mm -hmm. And that at the end you'll say, God, thank you for your grace in Jesus. Let's pray.